Welcome to the Dispense Magazine podcast. I'm your host, Sven Hosford. Dispense Magazine seeks to enhance the conversation between patient and physician about medical cannabis. Whatever you and your doctor might talk about, that's what we'll talk about here on this podcast. Today we'll hear from Dr. John Metcalf as he talks about integrating cannabis with holistic medicine. This conversation was recorded live as a part of a panel discussion at the Dispense with a Nonsense event held in Pittsburgh on July 14, 2018. Dr. Metcalf is a retired functional medicine physician with a deep passion to help spread the word about cannabis and real strategies to get to the root cause of illness and disease. I first asked Dr. Metcalf to define functional medicine. First of all, I want to say um, good afternoon, Pittsburgh. Good to be here. And uh, also that I have a lot of gratitude for being here, helping people along their health journeys. And uh, it's really, it changes my perspective so many things. Because I spent like 22 years doing occupational medicine, which really didn't really fulfill my spiritual quest. So a couple years ago, I got kind of, uh, I developed my own medical illness and decided to go down the functional medicine. Functional medicine tries to, instead of just treating an illness with a pill, they try to go upstream and try to find out some of the causes of that. And they try to deal more specifically with those issues rather than just giving you uh, another pill and then you get a side effect, you get another pill. Uh, like you have pain, you get opiates, you already know the crisis we're in concerning that. So as I did functional medicine, it was interesting, but as I started to research medical cannabis, uh, medical marijuana, then it really changed my perspective, my understanding, and I've spent the last nine months of my life researching the biochemistry and the physiology of it so that I could have an understanding of really how it works rather than just taking a four-hour mandated course by the state that unfortunately doesn't teach you a lot, but they teach you some of the basics. So as I did functional medicine, I went to Functional Medicine University. I did the Institute of Functional Medicine course. I decided to do more of the medical marijuana because that's more where I gravitated towards. And I think that there's more in this particular plant and all the different cannabinoids and all the different uh, compounds that are in there that can serve so many different purposes for people that it really is a game changer. If you really want to ask questions, I, I look forward to answering your questions because there's so much more there than actually can, you can possibly imagine. Versus just the 1960s and 70s, I get, get stoned. There's so much more to it than that. And that's why 30 independent medical boards state medical boards have approved medical marijuana in the United States, and uh, it continues to expand the list that's there. And that's a little bit about it. Was there anything about cannabis, do you think it actually fits within the model of functional medicine? Is it a good companion tool for your toolbox? Yeah, I think fact it probably goes upstream even more than functional medicine because you're talking about the endocannabinoid system. The endocannabinoid system was developed by uh, Dr. Raphael, um, Menchel, and he's from over in Israel, and he coined the term. In fact, he also uh, coined several other terms from that. But the endocannabinoid system is the master regulator of all your different systems, including your immune system, your nervous system, your endocrine, which is your hormones. It actually modulates that to bring it back into balance. And that's why so many times when you uh, see physicians, they treat this system but not that system. And that's what's unique about the endocannabinoids and the phytocannabinoids, which is the medical marijuana, because it actually works on the whole person rather than just on one symptom and one molecule. Because how often you go to the doctor, I can't sleep, all right? Here's Valium, here's a benzodiazepine, here's a sedative. But reality, all they're doing is masking your symptoms. It's gonna show up somewhere else. So you've gotta bring the body back into balance. Now endocannabinoids or medical marijuana is not the solution for everybody. You've got to do lifestyle changes. You've got to take responsibility for your health. Not let the guy with the white coat tell you, hey, this is the way we're going to do it. Because I guarantee you, you're going to run into problems down the road. I used to be a PCP. I used to do the same thing. But it's just not the right direction, in my opinion. I like that term you used going upstream to, to discover the problem. Um, was there anything particular? What was it that first caught your attention about cannabis? Well, actually, I was doing functional medicine, and we had a lot of these autistic kids come in. And they were kind of very hyperactive. They were kind of uh, bouncing all over the place. And we were giving them some hemp product, CBD, under their tongue. And within a few seconds to minutes, they were 
calm down. And I couldn't quite understand why this occurred. So that's when it started my journey along the cannabis and the hemp and all the different compounds that are in there. I've talked to other doctors that tell me that it was when they first learned about the uh, ECS, we'll call it the ECS, it's easier to remember. Sure. When they first learned about it, that's when like all the light bulbs went off and that's when they realized, oh, this isn't just about getting caught. Was that your experience? Yeah. I mean, the bottom line is, is back in the 60s and 70s, is that they bred the strains for high THC. THC is the psychoactive component because everybody wanted to get stoned. So that's the strains that were developed back then. And uh, that was more the indica. And then as time has come on, I'm sure you've seen in the news that all these moms have these autistic children or seizure disorders, that the typical neuroleptic or typical seizure medications are just not working. So they tried the CBD, and all of a sudden they reduced their seizures tremendously or completely. So that movement itself actually brought on the medical marijuana being approved, I think, in 30 states right now. And uh, so that movement in itself has been a real game changer for the United States. And I think, to be honest with you, I think over the next year at a federal level, I think that it's going to be legalized because right now there's 30 states that have medical marijuana, nine have recreational, and 12 have decriminalized medical marijuana because the research is now opening up the doors and there's so much more research coming out. When people, when the doctor says there's no research on it, that's a complete fallacy. There's actually double blind studies to show that it's effective dependent upon the disorder. In fact, in 2017, the National Academy of Science, Medicine, and Engineering reviewed 10,000 studies, and they found conclusive, strong medical evidence that medical marijuana can be used for chronic pain, it can be used for nausea and appetite suppressant from chemotherapy, and also uh, for uh, people that have problems with anxiety and depression. So it's really interesting the research that's coming out, and uh, it's also been good for spasms for multiple sclerosis. In fact, you probably know that on June 27th, they approved Epidiolex, which is the first uh, plant-based uh, CBD product for childhood seizure disorders. It should be available toward the end of the year. And they also have another product coming down the pipeline called Sativex, which is both THC and CBD, equal combinations, plant-based, which would be another game changer. Right now, they're doing phase two studies on that, even though it's been approved in 30 other countries. Now, you mentioned a, a few things. Uh, what are some of the other conditions that you are most excited about that shows promise that hasn't been really proven yet? Well, I think because the CBD and the THC are Schedule One drugs, which means that the federal government has made them illegal across the states. Even though states' rights now, there's 30 states that have uh, decided to pass their own laws that has not been challenged on a federal level at this point. I feel that there's certain things like, I think Pennsylvania, Dr. Levine, who's the medical director of medical marijuana at the state level, She's really proactive. I have to really comment. I really admire her for what she's done because she's added additional four uh, conditions to the 17 that were originally approved, including autism, uh, because we're one of the only states that approves autism as a sole condition uh, for treating with medical marijuana. And also uh, uh, epilepsy, that's another interesting fact, chronic pain, uh, because actually Pennsylvania and New Jersey are the only states that have used chronic pain uh, people that have opiate substance or use disorder, that they can use medical marijuana as a sole substitute in order to get off of it. Because right now there's abstinence, there's suboxone and methadone, which are opiates in themselves, and there's their basically medical marijuana. So it really depends upon the person's directive. I've tried to approach a lot of these, what they call suboxone clinics. Suboxone is like methadone. It's kind of like it, it's, a, it's an opiate, but it doesn't have the high that you experience from it. So it's kind of a substitute, but you can still get overdose from it. Uh, and I've tried to approach several, but they're not interested, to be honest with you, because I think that they're financially they're tied to the drug model, unfortunately. I know from having done an article about this and, and talking to some other people, a lot of times you run into the problem where uh, the insurance companies get in the way, and they say, we're not going to pay for your Suboxone or for your opiates if we have any trace of THC in the system. Right. Do you see any of that changing? Well, right now, as I give talks you know, across the city in Pittsburgh, a lot of people raise their hand and say, you know, my doctor says that if I am on medical marijuana and they do a drug test that shows I have THC, which is the psychoactive component, they'll drop me from the program. 
So patients are afraid, you know, to do that because if they cut off the source, and I'm sure you've been seeing the news about all the opiates. I mean, physicians are getting prosecuted left and right. They have new guidelines out now. So it's really a, a conundrum because the medical profession created the issue with the help of Big Pharma. Big Pharma never told us about the addictive component. And now that we've created it, I feel part of my responsibility is to educate people about alternatives. Because when it comes to harm reduction, medical marijuana has been shown to be the best substitute because there's only a 9% addiction rate with medical marijuana or, or cannabis itself. But those are skewed because if you look at the people actually incorporated in those studies, they've actually included people that got busted for being on recreational, and they had to put them in a program, and they also put them at part of the addiction. So that really is a skewed thing. As of last year, 2016, 46,000, excuse me, 46,000 Americans died from opiate abuse. Part of the problem, as you said, is that doctors can prescribe opiates, yes. but so few of them even recognize opiate withdrawal or opiate addiction if they see them in patients, and, and even fewer of those have the ability to prescribe anything like Suboxone. You have to get special training to, to prescribe Suboxone as well. You do, you do. So any, basically any dentist can get you hooked, uh, but so few doctors really won't have the tools to get you unhooked. No, in fact, if you look at the studies, there hasn't been a study on opiates more than a year that have showed to look at the quality of life and long-term effects, uh, which is kind of sad. In fact, they did a study in 2016 at the Minneapolis VA that compared one group on opiates, one group on Tylenol or neuroleptics like Lyrica, Neurontin, and they found at the end of one year that the level of functioning was the same in both groups, but yet the intensity of the pain was less in the non-opiate group. So I thought that was really interesting. In fact, the CDC actually recommends that you don't check for THC when you prescribe opiates, but unfortunately, most physicians still do, and uh, because they're not really up on the literature or the knowledge, patients are demanding that they become educated, otherwise they're gonna go somewhere else. Anybody in the audience have any questions for Dr. Metcalf? Go ahead, uh, Could you explain the difference Well, medical cannabis is more of a political term where the 30 states, independent medical boards, have said, listen, we're going to allow people based upon certain conditions. Every state has their own conditions. We have 21, and if you have one of those conditions, then we can certify you. Then you'll get a card, you go down to the dispensary, then you see a pharmacist, they talk to you about the different routes of administration, the different products that they have and then you make a selection of what you want, and usually it'll take you 30 to 90 days in order to find a regimen that works good for you. I usually recommend you start low and go slow in order to find that optimal dose so that you don't end up getting uh, tolerant or addicted to it. But even if you did get addicted, let's say to the psychoactive component, usually within uh, 48 hours to two weeks, pretty much it's out of your system. The receptors in your body have reset themselves and you can start the process all over again. Whereas with opiates, it's entirely different. They affect the frontal cortex in an entirely different manner. Now, when you talked about the CBD, how it's different, it's just one of the phytocabinoids. You've heard of CBD, the non-psychoactive component. You've also heard of the THC, which is the psychoactive, but then there's also CBC, CBG, CBN, and it goes on and on and on. There's also another classification of medicines uh, called terpenes. They give, it the flat, they give it the aroma and flavor and they also have their medicinal values as well. So that's kind of a crux of what you just said. And there's nine states that have recreational that anybody can buy within that state that follows you know, over the age of 18. But isn't the CBD from a different part of the plant? No, no, no. I mean, when you talk about CBD, most people think about hemp because it falls under the Industrial Plant uh, Act, which means it's separate from cannabis, so it's not classified. It's not a Schedule One drug that cannabis CBD is. So therefore, it comes from the stalk, it comes from the flower, it comes from the leaf. So, but you get a lot more on the leaf. You get a lot more, it depends upon the strain too, and whether the genetics and how, because a lot of them are still THC heavy and light on the CBD, but they are coming out with strains, cannabis strains, that are strictly CBD oriented because mothers are looking for a product for the child that has seizure disorders. And usually you want to look for an eight to one ratio of CBD to THC. 
Um, that's what moms are looking for. But there's not a lot of those products available right now. And when they go to the, I'm sorry, I don't want to take When they go to the clinical pharmacist or the yes. they're going to get it, they will explain which type of cannabinoid would work best for theirs, which type of CBD, or the components of the plant would work best for their disease. Well, I can't really tell you the level of sophistication. No. I'm sure it varies from pharmacist to pharmacist based upon the level of training they have. I'm sure they're well-schooled in the products that are available at that particular dispensary. Um, but if they really don't have products on certain things, they probably are not going to research it a lot. Let's say like CBG, which is the parent compound for THC and CBD. Uh, so, and there are specific strains that are actually much higher in certain of those. But there's over like 700 different compounds within, medical, within the cannabis plant itself. One of my mentors is Dr. Ethan uh, Russo, who in uh, 2000 coined the clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. It's a real interesting, uh, it's a real interesting uh, disorder, and I highly recommend everybody read that. They talk about migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, and fibromyalgia, and they talk about the pathophysiology of why that occurs, and it also can be related to a lot of other disorders as well. So would you recommend going into that pharmacy having done some research? Yes, I do. Because your research and education is, is, is up to you to, to find. I, I say don't trust the guys with the white coats because really this is your healing process and you need to be responsible. They can educate you, but then you're the ultimate responsible what goes in and the outcome that, that comes from that. We'll be right back with more of Dr. Metcalf after we give some thanks to our sponsors for this event. Cresco Yaltra, Pennsylvania's first operational grower processor with dispensaries in Butler, Pennsylvania and the Strip District in Pittsburgh. Saliva Wellness, Pittsburgh's first operational dispensary. The Healing Center, Washington, Pennsylvania's first dispensary. Holistic Health with Mandy, the practice of Mandy Bapkes, a board-certified holistic and nutritional practitioner. Glass Gone Wow, Southwestern Pennsylvania's premier source for all the accessories needed to consume medical cannabis, and Medical Marijuana Solutions, providing patient services in three locations around the Pittsburgh area. Now back to the Dispense with the Nonsense panel discussion and more from Dr. Metcalf. An audience member asked about the process of getting your medical marijuana card. What makes kind of Medical Marijuana Solutions different is that when somebody comes in, it's like a one-shop stop. In other words, we register you with the state. We certify you, assuming that you have the medical records and the identification to match up one of the 21 qualifying conditions in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, I evaluate those, and then I issue a, um, a recommendation. I cannot prescribe because it's a Schedule One that would be against federal law. And I go into the state portal. I certify you for one year. Uh, and the charge that we typically do for initial certification is like $200. However, there are discounts based upon seniors, veterans, whatever. Now, that can vary from place to place. What you have to be careful about is there's some organizations that will certify you for three months, and you'll come back, and then they'll certify you again. And each time, money's building up. They'll draw you in the front door at a lower price, but then start tacking on a lot of other things. There's actually one group that was charging wellness exams, drug screens, consultation. I mean, they were telling the patients these were state mandated. That's just not true. I give you a certificate for one year. I don't have you come back to see me unless you have a problem. If you have a problem, you can reconsult me at no additional charge to you. The state, in order to protect me, I'm a certifying physician. I am not a treating physician. Even though I would like to go into the pain management and the opiate addiction, because that's really true to my heart, but finding enlightened physicians that want to do that is a very difficult task currently because they're not willing to change their own professional model. So until patients or until the medical community is wider acceptance of this, it's going to be an uphill battle. So I wait for the time when that occurs. And what's nice about all the dispensaries, they're having uh, educational programs, which I think is very important to educate people because education is essential for you to make decisions on your own body. Don't trust the guy with the white coat, which I said before. This is your journey, your health, and you have to make decisions. If I educate you and then you decide to do something else, then I've done my part.
This is up to you. This is your life, not my life. You have no idea how refreshing it is to hear a white guy say, so don't trust the white guys. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Dr. Metcalf. Now, I understand that uh, with the basics of the four-hour course that physicians are required to take, that basically only uh, qualifies them, at least ethically, to say, yes, you are qualified. But there are some doctors like yourself who have gone in and really done a lot more research, and the state is perfectly fine with you recommending what types of cannabis to take or what, how to deliver or uh, you know, different strains or, or what terpenes you're looking for or delivery systems, dosage. Do you give that, those kinds of uh, advice or that kind of recommendation? Yeah, I mean, most of my colleagues that have gone through the four-hour certification from the state, and again, the course doesn't teach you a lot, and a lot of times they do it on the side and they leave it to the dispensary, either the nurse practitioner or the, or the uh, pharmacist to kind of instruct you on what to do. Well, I take exception to that. If I'm going to recommend something, I need to know something about it. I need to educate you. And one of my mentors, a Dr. Dustin Sulak up in Maine, he actually has a website that kind of walks you through the whole process. And uh, so I always tell people about that particular website so that you're not left in the dark. Because even if you go to the dispensary and you see a pharmacist, again, it depends upon the products that they have and what you want to do. And uh, I think as time goes on, especially as flour and, and uh, dry leaf become available, especially toward the end of, of next month, the prices will come down because right now they're kind of expensive uh, because there's only like six growers I know out of 12 that are actually providing product for 27 dispensaries within the state. So I'm just saying is there's a lot of interesting things coming down the pipeline. Eight universities here in Pennsylvania, the only state in the union, are now qualified to start doing medical research on cannabis which is unheard of um, because the federal government limits that because when it's a Schedule One, there's no funding. Nobody's going to fund. Because if you can't patent a plant, then they're not going to fund the study because they're not going to make any money on it. So things are changing, and it's really an exciting time, and I'm glad to be part of that movement because the movement will take off. I guarantee it. And the question that I really is burning with me is, do you think that all of this waking up of doctors to cannabis is going to help shift the entire paradigm away from pharma only and pharma and surgery only into more acceptance of plant medicine and other types of healing generally within the medical community no i'll be honest with you i just don't because the bottom is the big pharma is the one that funds our education and so i think cannabis and it, there's, there's pharmaceutical companies now involved with this. You know, the Epidiolex that I mentioned, the Sativex. You know, it's, it's coming down the pipeline. You know, people come to a point that insurance companies and big pharma, they want, they want part of the action. They want the money. I mean, this is about politics. This is about money. So I think it's going to change as time goes on. But until the federal government changes the Schedule One listing, then right now it's going to be more of a cash-based model, even though you might see some physicians that will certify you under your health plan. There's a real question about the ethics and about the legality of that, so you have to be very careful, in my opinion. But I think things are changing, and the door's open, and it's not going to go backwards. I wish physicians would be more open, but when you go to school, you learn this is what we do. They're not going, and they spend seven, eight, ten years of their lives learning this. It's kind of hard to change them, to look at something else, despite the research, uh, because they're so pigeonholed into what they think and what they see and what they believe. If they don't know, they'll say it doesn't exist or they'll refer you off to a specialist and that specialist will basically put you through the same regimen of medications. And I think that there's so much more to that, lifestyle changes, everything else. So it's part of a comprehensive program, not just one particular avenue. If you have a patient who has a condition that would benefit by this, by this treatment, let's just say, for example, um, MS spasms, and they're currently living in a long-term care facility, and they don't have the ability to take their own medicines, and their medicines are dispensed through the facility. Um, should the family provide the, the medical cannabis, or as the doctor in that place, can you say, okay, for family to dispense this, or is there any way to get it onto the medicine cart for the, um, for the nurse to dispense that? And if so, do they have to count it every shift? 
What is the nitty um, gritty about it's a, getting that? It's a very excellent question. Right now, most nursing homes, hospices, uh, they really don't have a policy about that. So right now, the caregiver is going to be a family member in order they go out and assuming that that facility allows you to bring it in to dispense it to your relative then that's a whole separate question in itself unfortunately because a lot of these programs are tied into federal funding that you're going to encounter resistance and a lot of the administrators say to us oh we'd really like to do this but so unfortunately uh, until something changes way upstream federal government you're going to run against you can you're going to meet resistance everywhere you go unfortunately are, are family members allowed in most facilities to become caregivers and provide uh to their to their loved ones in the facility you know that? i think that depends upon the facility yeah, yeah. and right now it's not right right you kind of sneak it in and close the door because if something happens in that premise they're ultimately responsible even though you might have brought it in they're responsible for anything that is given to the patient. So it's, it's a lot of times just a taboo. And until the mindset is changed, until people are educated, then policies don't change. That's a very slow process. So let's take a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure if I agree with the statement, just trust, just trust the white folks. I, I, they, that's the way they were trained and people grew up with right, we're, we're recommending you don't trust the white folks. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, okay. I know, okay. but I think most people do. Right. And I, I disagree with that statement um, partially. I think patients should get involved with the treatment and the diagnosis. Absolutely. And, and if the doctor does not appreciate what you're saying, go to somebody else. Did I you think agree that, kind of with that, Dr. Metcalf? Yeah, I mean, when I, it's kind of a blanket statement about don't trust them i mean they have good intentions don't get me wrong you know but the thing is when you go in and you're allotted seven minutes there's not a lot you're going to be able to tell that physician or he's willing to listen to um so i'm just saying is is listen to what they say and then educate yourself because sometimes the cure from allopathic tends to be much more toxic than the actual disease itself you know especially with autoimmune disorders their idea is to give you a biologic, which sounds very natural, but it suppresses your immune system. And your immune system is the one that basically is the thing that keeps you going. So that's why I say mistrust them, because I think that ultimately this is your journey. They're there to educate you, and then it's for you to make that decision what you want to do. That's the way I see it. That will do it for this edition of the Dispense Magazine podcast. Join us again next time for more conversation about medical cannabis. I'm your host, Sven Hosford. Thanks for listening. This podcast is a production of Mindful Medicine, LLC.